Okay. All right. Get my cue. Okay. Uh, the um, public works. <laughs> 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 I'm, co I'm coming off jury duty, so I'm a little bit out of it here. Um, okay, so the uh, Cuyahoga County Public Works Procurement and Contracting Committee meeting for Wednesday, October 20th, 2021 will be called to order. Roll call. Good morning, and as a reminder, this meeting is being live streamed and recorded for all who are in attendance and watching online. Calling the roll, Mr. Tuma? Here. Mr. Miller? Here. Ms. Baker? Here. Ms. Conwell? Present. Mr. Sweeney? Mr. Sweeney is absent. There is a quorum. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, if I could, is there any public comment this morning? No, Mr. Chair, no one is signed in. All right, and if uh, we could have approval of minutes from the October 6, 2021 meeting. I so move. Do I have a second? We have a motion and a second. All the second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. And Madam Clerk, if you could please read the first matter uh, into committee, referred to committee. Resolution number 2021-0233, authorizing the appropriation of real property for replacement of old Rockside Road Bridge number 00.42 over the Cuyahoga River in the city of Independence and Village of Valley View. Okay. And... Um, we have Miss uh, Miss English. I think um, Director Dever just wanted to make a statement. Do you want me to do this first, or you? You know what? We um, we could we could hear the the statement first. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. I appreciate it, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mike Dever, Director of Public Works. Um, today, I just wanted to come before you today is uh, our former county engineer Dave Marquard had retired uh, right around the beginning of the year. And um, uh, we've obviously had the position posted, and it's taken some time. Uh, but I'm very happy to report today that um, we've uh, uh, selected a new county engineer for the office. And the county engineer's responsibilities, specifically, just so you can be aware, is anything that was related to the roads and bridge program, uh, maintenance, as you guys, uh, as, as the council members are aware, uh, our statutory responsibility, our, our uh, the bridges here in Cuyahoga County. And uh, I'm, so I'm happy to report to you today that we have a new county engineer. His name is Dave Ray. I brought him down here just to a, do a brief introduction so he could say hello to you. Dave has a, a storied career with um, uh, the Ohio Department of Transportation. He ultimately became a deputy director in District 5 down by uh, Columbus. Um, and he's a great addition to the team. And I just wanted to up, up and say hello, and then hopefully in the near future he can meet you. Dave, how about you? Thank you, Mike. Pleasure to meet all of you. Uh, as, as Mike mentioned, uh, most of my career was uh, with ODOT and in government. So for me, I, I'm just happy to be back in government. So it is very nice to uh, meet you. I did the last five years with consulting engineers and uh, got a chance to certainly see the private side, but... Uh, it's good to be here. All right. Well, thank you for stopping in, and uh, we welcome you aboard and look forward to working with you. And uh, Mr. Marquardt will miss, uh, but we look forward to working with you as well. So Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Right. Okay, Ms. English. Thank you, uh, Mr. Director. Appreciate you stopping in. Okay, Ms. English. Thank you. Nicole English with Public Works. So the first item we have here is... Um, authorizing the appropriation of real estate. So as you know, that typically when we do a project, if it has right of way, we go through a process that's um, approved by the federal government as far as appraisals, we make offers, we talk to the owners. Most times we come to terms, they sign, and we um, pay them to use their land during construction or if it's permanent forever. Um, sometimes we cannot come to an agreement with some of the owners. That's the case here with three of the 15 parcels that we need to acquire for the old Rockside Road Bridge, which is located in Independence and Valley View. Um, and the one, one parcel is um, really due to a title issue. Um, the person who's on the title is no longer um, living 
and it was intended to go to the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. It didn't quite get transferred right. So it's more of a clearing up of a title issue, not any problems um, that we're having with the owner. We just can't get in touch with him, obviously. So um, the other two are what I'd rather focus on. We've given you two exhibits um, through Mr. Boyle that give you some um, aerial photos of the two properties we're talking about. The first one is Frank and Frick um, that we've offered them $40,292 based on an appraisal um, to be using a five parking spaces and kind of their frontage, which is going to be for the temporary road that we need to build while the construction is going on for the bridge. They aren't real happy with our offer. They've kind of just pushed back. They aren't giving us any feedback as far as why it should be more, you know, um, following the process they have to give us information in order for us to up our offer for a reason. Um, they're just not really interested in talking to us. Um, it's been going on now for um, practically a year. I think they honestly just think that the, they can stop the project if they don't talk to us. So we have no choice. We have to go on um, and file in order to get this moving. The other piece is Thornburg, Thornburg Station. Um, they have been in talks with us. Um, a little bit, this is on the other side of the river. We've been back and forth with them. They express concerns with the price. Um, it's related to parking spots um, for their development that they have there. Um, we've tried to give them some ideas, you know, go out and get pricing for how much it would cost you to rent other parking. Maybe if you want to give us pricing for how much more it's going to cost you to pay the valet to run further, um, but they just aren't giving us any of that information back. So we've tried to help them as best we can um, in order for them you know, sort of help us help you um, type of situation, but they just aren't getting back to us with any information. It's taking a long time in between our conversations. So this is a federal aid project. We have two and a half million of federal funds. We have practically um, just under two million of issue one funds. So we have to move on with the project. We just can't sit and wait for this real estate any further. So we are asking for approval to appropriate. We will work. Um, even up to the time we're filing through when we file, we'll still be back and forth with the property owner trying to get to a resolution. I mean, very rarely do we actually go in front of a judge. I mean, we often settle before we get to that point, but we have to make this filing in order to keep the construction project on, on schedule. Okay, appreciate that. Um, if I could, uh, what's the time frame for the project? So there, they've filed um, final plans through ODOT, so we're hoping by the end of the year to be able to start bidding the project, which is why we need to take this action. We cannot bid the project. We won't get authority through ODOT unless we've taken this filing. But once we file and put our deposits in court, they, ODOT does consider the right-of-way cleared, and we can start moving forward. Can this be done on three readings, or do you need a suspension? We'd appreciate two if possible. Um, just again to expedite. We've, we kind of held as long as we could because we were trying to work with these owners and thinking we could try to get somewhere at least on a couple of them. Um, and we just are, you know, we're not getting anywhere. Um, so wh what, what is the time frame for the temporary takings? Like how long would each of the, those business or facilities be out of spots? So the, um, there's two different phases. So I think on the aerial that we gave you, there's a little bit of narrative on the right side showing that during phase one, um, a, a certain portion gets taken, and then during phase two, it gets turned over. So I would, do you know how long Jessica, we had estimated? Jessica French is our um, land up. You're sorry. <laughs> no, you're okay. Um, so, so in total, it'll be um, two years, 24 months, just because you have to make the temporary bridge replace the old bridge, take out the temporary bridge, and all of the utility companies that temporarily moved also have to all move back in. So we wanna make sure that we're conservative with our time. Um, in the first phase, uh, phase one is part of your, um, part of your documents. Um, we are working on the water line, and that is already there. There's a water line there, there's a utility easement there. Um, already we're replacing that water line since we're already doing the bridge. Um, and it, our bridge is moving out a little bit, so that's the reasoning for that. Um, that will be about 12 weeks, and that's in that area where you see yellow. Um, those parking spots will be impacted during that time. Um, after that 12-week period, um, or about 12-week period, that's when they'll begin creating the new temporary bridge. Those, those uh, yellow spots will be back in business They'll be able to use them, and then that's when we're going to go on to, it's owned by FIP Master Funding, um, but, 
but Thornburg does use those those spots for um, valet. I don't think they have a, a true lease, but they have some sort of verbal agreement with um, the envir the e check people. Okay. Um, um, what were there any alternatives offered to the the part for the parcels? You know, for the for them temporarily. I mean, was there like maybe offered to do half at one time and half at another, or anything like that? So the way the line, this one, this is the part of the court, the one that we're talking about that can't give it in the long section. Yeah. So the idea is that the water line goes through there, right? Oh, so they're going to okay. be digging right through. The good part is it's only twelve weeks. So once they um, are done with them, they really they'll get back into them, even though we're paying them for a little bit of a longer time. The other piece is currently some of the parking spots on the west side are really in, not on their property, and they're kind of using right away and different things, and you know, we've agreed to put them back for them, and they'll still have use for them. So that's kind of some, a benefit, another benefit they're getting that, I mean, we could have, you know, taken the parking space, a couple parking spots away that aren't really um, on the parcel. So, so that Thornburg station, is that the, is that the e-check thing? E-check is, is on the other side. Okay. It's that parcel 20. But what happens is in the evening, E-check obviously doesn't need that huge lot. There's been only employees going on there. So they're, they have some kind of handshake deal going on with Thornburg Station. Nothing that's exactly inked that they could have showed us a lease that is so many part, you know, how much they're paying. But parcel 20 did sign, and they accepted the offer. That's not going to court. Okay. They, they accepted everything on parcel 20. Um, it's just 21 that's... Okay, um, and then what regard in regards to the smaller lot? What if we can't find the air or have issues with the air? What's going to happen with that? That's a for the kind of a oh the, so situation. so when you go to court to appropriate, they'll end up um, publishing and doing a judgment entry in the end of the game, and we have clear title. Okay, to I mean, so that's just the whole point of um, and we did try to look for obituaries, but he died in like 1927. No. <laughs> So, I mean, it, we tried to find successors. It just it was not working out in our favor. <laughs> you would think with the Internet. No. Okay. Um, yeah, 1927. Okay. Well, there we go. Um, any questions from my colleagues? This one. Yes. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Conwell, then Mr. Miller. To the chair, to Nicole. So when we go to court and we appropriate, I know usually when we do temporary easements, we pay money. Will we still have to pay them money even if they make yep. us go through this process? Yes. Yeah, so what we we have to do is we have established the fair market values, mm -hmm. which are on, um, I believe, on the resolution. Um, it's quite a bit of money, actually. Uh, where's the number? Sorry. Okay. It's 40292 for parcel 16. And then for parcel 20, it is 17572 And again, they're the ones that are, we're using it less. And then for the... The deceased man, it's only $350, a short amount. But we have to deposit that money when we file the court case. So they're, they could go in and pull that out any time and say, okay, we're going to settle, they get the money. Or we continue to go back and forth in court. And if there's a higher value that's negotiated, then we'd have to pay them the extra. But they are all, they're at least entitled to this base amount that we have established through our appraisal process. And through the chair, in terms of, I've never thought to ask this question on the funds that we pay out where is that coming from in our in, from your your budget road and bridge yep it road comes. and bridge dollars so we did when we budgeted this project i mean we knew we had real estate costs that we were going to have so we did budget an amount for real estate costs and this is falling within that so number anytime we have temporary easements it comes from that account whatever Correct. that project is exactly are we re reimbursed anyway by the Federal so government or um, sometimes we could be if we have federal funds and issue one funds. Um, this one, I would believe the 30% of issue one, if as long as we don't exhaust the funds during construction, can be used um, to replace uh, our outgoing funds on this. And we're used to this process where people have refused? Yeah, it's... Not super common on our normal, just, you know, if we were doing a bridge and we just have four parcels, but on big projects, we see it. I think Sprague, we recently did, and we might have filed on 20 of the almost 200 parcels. It's just a matter of some people don't want to talk to you ever. You know, some people just aren't going to, they think if they, they don't ever talk, the project won't come forward. So you just, you know, there's a small percent that you just kind of assume you're going to end up in this place. And a lot of times, Jessica does a really nice job of constantly following up with them. So even though we file, that kind of makes them start talking a little more because they realize now they're not stopping the project. And so she can even get them settled between the time that we file and when you end up in court. 
So that period is, you know, she's not stopping talking to them. We're going to continue to talk to them. It's just the action that we need in order to move the project. Thank you. Miller. So uh, <clears throat> what is the all-in construction cost, acquiring property, engineering, construction, the whole thing? Yeah, the whole cost is around $6.5 million of construction. And I think um, the right-of-way costs are not that minimal, I mean, are fairly minimal. I think it was in $100,000 or so for the right-of-way cost. So just about $6.6 .6 million total. And this project, just to remind everyone, um, we had abandoned this road years ago. We didn't feel this bridge was ours. They actually went to the Supreme Court in 2014 back and forth between us and the city. It was a Supreme Court judgment that said we had to replace the bridge. But once we walk away, um, the bridge will be the city's going forward. Um, the independents will have ownership of the bridge. So this is, we kind of in court, they told us the county has to pay for it all. Luckily we did have some federal funding and we got issue one, but the city does not have a responsibility on this because of that Supreme Court ruling that we had. So, uh... Once the city of Independence takes it over, then they'll be responsible for any maintenance and any future repairs. Is exactly. that correct? You're right. And uh, on the on the map that shows parcel 20 and 21, I see where the the yellow area is that's impacted, but I don't see the parking area shaded in purple. Can you tell me where that is? just um, to the north across Old Rockside Road. If you're looking at the yellow, it's this here. It might uh, have not come out good on your printer. Okay, fine. And am I correct that uh, all of the cases that we're filing on are only temporary takings? Yes, all three of these. Okay, thank you. Miller, uh, Ms. Baker, you have something? Yeah, just um, just going back to that purple now, I didn't realize. So is it the purple and the yellow that's impacted? They're both impacted at different times. They're owned by two different people. So the purple owner settled with us. He did, okay. He accepted the, the amount of money um, and the terms. So that owner has accepted. It's just now the yellow that we're dealing with. Do we with. know on that um, parcel 21, uh, it, do they tell you how much their loss is? because of what they're not going to be able to valet in the time that it's tied up? So that's the problem, is they aren't giving us any information. They won't even give So you we've that. been trying to explain to them, um, help us, you know, help you. Is it that, you know, you aren't going to be able to seat half a restaurant or you're, you know, give us some explanation as to what you need those spots for or how much it's going to cost to cure those spots. And they have not been able to provide us extra. I mean, we even went to the point of contacting some building owners around to say, would you be willing to lease them parking in the evening if they needed it? And they said yes, and we got them in contact, but nothing became of it. So, I mean, we kind of have gone above and beyond on this to try to help them. Again, we understand this isn't what they do every day, trying to you know answer to us. So we tried to help, but still nothing, um, nothing that they've given us in writing back. Did I hear you say that would be tied up for two years? The the way we purchased the. The property is normally in a 24-month increment just in case whatever could happen, but those parking spots in the schedule are only to be gone for 12 weeks. At a, once that water line goes in, right. they'll be released back to them. And so we've had that agreement um, in our construction documents to say once you're able to give those back, you have to give them back. Okay. So it will be sooner than, you know, way sooner. If this did go to court, they probably would have a number, I'm sure. We hope so. I mean, that's what the problem we have is we have to follow the guidelines. And so we can't, you know, they can't just come back and say, well, we want 100,000. We say, well, how do you give us some backup for it? And so once we go to court, I mean, depends what the judge decides. I mean, maybe they won't have to give the backup, but at least then he can decide. The judge can. We can't at this level. And they have never come back with even an outrageous number. So they, we have been talking to them about the, um, they own a parking lot um, across. The canal, not yeah. the river part, but the canal. Um, we have been talking to them about um, kind of changing the grade of that parking lot to make it easier for you know customers to park there and then go to the parking lot. Um, we started these these conversations back in May, 
Um, and they came up, they now, um, September, they finally came up with some sort of plan, but then we asked them to get bids. Um, I think they came back to me, I, I looked back today, September 14th, but then I followed up, I followed up every other week, you know, since yeah. then, and they haven't brought me any bids or anything. So I don't know what that number is. I, I'm, I have a feeling it's probably going to be pretty high um, just because they're completely getting rid of a slope and then adding quite a bit of parking. Um, I would estimate probably five to $700,000, but um, they haven't provided me with actual you know, proposals from construction companies. And that's a lot for a 12 week use of parking spots. You know, so we'd rather talk to them about you know, leasing them somewhere else across the street, or again, if there's an added cost for valets running further, you know, something like that seems more realistic than, you know, spending that kind of money. For, for temporary use. Right. Um, if I may, on the uh, lot 16, that's a large shaded yellow, but only <laughs> five of those spaces. So, so what, what happens with the other part of that yellow? So that's where that road is going to go through. So even though that's the only parking spots we're taking of them, that's still their land okay. where the temporary road and temporary bridge will pass through. So we still have to rent that land from them. So the good part is land is normally cheaper than the parking spots because nothing is happening on it today. Okay. But um, we do you know, have to pay them for that and for the parking so spots. So they have no plans for that land as far as you know, and it's been vacant. It's just a no, I mean, vacant I, lot. I think the biggest issue with them is just that the project itself um, at least that's what seems to be the main concern. It's not necessarily the parking spaces. They don't like the noise. They don't like the um, construction just in general. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I'm just, it's yeah. just, again, you know, middleman at this point. But they've been really upset about just the construction itself. We really haven't had any issues with the parking spaces. Um, just, just the inconvenience <laughs> of construction. Right. But as far as use goes, they are not using it for anything other than these five spots. No, it's it's grass right now. I mean, it's um, and then their building is behind behind that, and then they have they do have areas for trucking and additional parking in the back as well. Um, that will not be impacted. No. Okay. Well, good. Thank you. I appreciate the answers. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ms. Baker. Anything else? Okay. With that. Um, I'll make a motion for uh, moving this along on second reading suspension at your request so we can get this through, um, so we can get that court process into play. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a second from Councilman Miller uh, to <clears throat> move <clears throat> R2021-0233 on second reading suspension. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. All right. Thank you. And oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and Madam Clerk, if you could read the next uh, piece of legislation, like, uh, read the next piece of legislation into the record, please. <laughs> Ordinance number 2021-0013, amending chapter 503 of the County Code, Small Business Enterprise Program Policies and Procedures. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk. And uh, could you please just state your name for the record? Lenora Lockett. Director, Department of Equity and Inclusion. Okay, and um, uh, Lenore, you obviously were in here a few a few weeks or a week ago. I don't know. It seems <laughs> it seems a long time ago, <laughs> but uh, you were in here in the interim. I had asked that uh, you put together a more compact type presentation, and then uh, I asked also my colleagues to prepare any questions that they might have uh, for you for this morning. So, um, if you want to proceed, thank you. I'm going to, um, again, Lenore Lockett, Department of Equity and Inclusion. I'm going to skip over the overview since this is the second time we're meeting right. to get to um, the summary of the changes to the program. And again, I'm here to provide information and details on the proposed changes. Um, so I'm going to start with an overview and then obviously as you have questions, if I need to go to the other slides or provide further details, I'm, that's what I'm here right. for. So the summary of the proposed changes um, is listed, are listed here. They're a combination of 
um, additional recommendations from the 2020 disparity study that was submitted in the fall and the executive orders that were issued in January that um, align with those eight recommendations from the disparity study. They're also layered on top of the previous recommendations from the 2014 the disparity study. And in the 2014 disparity study, there were um, an increase in race and gender neutral initiatives, and there was some limited race conscious. The, the following recommendations are, again, a mix of race and gender neutral recommendations and some increased or intensified race and gender conscious initiatives. As we evaluated the program, um, there was a, a group I would like to um, give credit that it wasn't just Department of Equity and Inclusion. It was um, Naylor Berg, Clerk of Courts, as her role with the, as liaison for the Citizens Advisory Council on Equity. And also a part of that group was the law director, Greg Hoof, that we had a series of meetings to, tr to make sure that we were um, implementing the recommendations that were in align with the disparity study recommendations because you have to make sure that your programs are based on and in line with the legally defensible disparity study that you have. The first recommendation is to extend the certification period from one year to two years. Currently, um, when you, a company or business gets certified, they get certified for one year and they recertify on an annual basis. We're looking to extend that certification to a two-year period. We feel that this, this provides, uh, reduces the burden to the business of annually recertifying. And even though the recertification process is, is less onerous, it still is a process that they have to go through to get recertified. But at the same time, one of the benefits of the two years that is not so long that the there are records and information on the companies and businesses that are certified, we want to make sure that we have as accurate of information as possible. The next recommendation is related to contract by contract goal setting. When we went from the SBE program, the SBE program was um, race and gender neutral, it does not require um, a disparity study to have those goals. Um, when we went to the, based on the 2014 study, we had aspirational goals. Again, those were based on a disparity studies analysis of our market and based on groupings of the category, the purchases that we make. For example, um, construction, they gave us an estimate of what the minority participation based on our market was, and also the participation of women-owned businesses. And they did that for certain categories. And generally, we would set goals based on that fixed number overall. Contract by contract goal setting means that we have to have a further definition of the scope of work delineated by the different scope components. And then from that, we're gonna use the data that's in the current disparity study. They have provided a listing of the market availability um, based on our market and what we purchase. And for those items of scope, we will do a, a breakdown for the actual um, estimate of participation uh, available MBEs and WBEs. And I can go into that later. I, uh, I believe we saw the spreadsheet where we're doing the calculations based on best practices, what's done nationally with the DBE program. And the next request is that we're looking at informal bids and RFPs and RFQs. Again, our, our goal is to increase in participation. For formal bids and RFPs, that's when we're gonna use the contract by contract goal setting. Those are purchases over 50,000. However, the county makes a significant amount of purchases under 50,000. In comparison, on average, formal bids, RFPs and RFQs, we have about 85 RFPs, RFBs and RFQs issued over 50,000 in a year. However, purchases under 50,000, on average, that's the, if you're familiar with the Board of Control, um, PO and DO list, on average, there's at least 10 to 15 bids, I mean, awards, contracts and purchase awards under 50,000 on a weekly basis on the BOC agenda. If you extrapolate that, that's about 500 opportunities compared to the 85. So we're looking to take advantage of the informal bid process to increase MBE and WBE participation. Now, the benefit of the, in, the informal bidding process is that you have a shorter bidding window. It, the minimum is required is eight hours. Most of them are a day to five days. And it's a lower um, threshold, so usually there's less 
um, a lower threshold on perform rarely any performance bonds, and there's also quicker turnaround, so that in that works with the cash flow, makes it a little more attractive. So we're looking for the informal bids and RFPs to, while we're not gonna set goals, we're looking to make sure we increase awareness, awareness of our small businesses, women businesses, and, and minority businesses of those opportunities by making sure that they get, that we're alerted by the departments, that the departments make sure that they reach out based on the county, current list of county certified MBEs and WBEs and provide notification to those businesses about this at the time that it's advertised about those opportunities. The two days is just to make sure that we're aware because of the short bidding period, not that they're gonna get additional time, they're gonna get the same time as any other business. The two days is for internal to make sure we have a, a listing of who may be potentially interested based on our certification list. The next change relates to the prime vendor credit. Currently, um, there's a 20% credit for a prime vendor that's already certified as an SBE, MBE, or WBE for that item. Usually our goals are um, maximum and aggregate is about 30%. So usually if that prime is a MBE, WBE, or, MB, or SBE, SBE submits a prime, that 20% credit means on average they only have to sub 10%. What we found, again, based on the fact that we're only having 85 formal bids, RFPs, and RFQs per year, that when you get a credit that usually takes away opportunities from two categories, whatever category the prime is certified in, and if they're certified in another additional category, then that means there's only one opportunity for another diversity category. So what we're looking at with this recommendation is that the prime still gets up to 20%, but it's only for one category. So again, when we look at the 85 formal bids opportunities a year, and then when you reduce that, sometimes we can't make a goal if there's not certified MBEs in that scope of work. Sometimes we can't set a goal from that 85 if we're using federal funds because they might have a, their own program or precludes that. Or sometimes we can't set a goal because it may be um, set aside or more likely to be done for a nonprofit. So again, you're looking at that 85, and then when you reduce it down, that still limits the opportunities. But if you can shore up the opportunities by making sure that when we can set a goal, we can make an opportunity as applicable for each of the three categories. Um, the, the, the next requirement that we've changed is, necess is more about the enforcement and the shoring up the, the requirement that we want to have um, more extensive review of the, the good faith efforts. So again, based on the 2014 disparity study, there was aspirational goals. So it was basically try to have some SBEs, MBEs, and WBEs. So if a vendor provided documentation that they reached out to five or six vendors, and we were able to confirm that, and based on their partial, um, their whether they had some participation, the feedback that we got, we would make an assessment of their um, good faith effort to meet the goal. This, this emphasis now will be to make sure, again, that we're providing an opportunity for each specific category. So now the good faith effort will be, we had a goal of SBE, MBE, WBE. What SBEs did you reach out to? What MBEs did you reach out to? What WBEs did you reach out to? Again, to make sure that there was a good faith effort to reach and provide opportunities for all of the categories, not just a overview that might be lacking in specific categories, which again will be lacking if there's outreach lacking in a specific categories, then there's a lack, usually there's gonna be a lack of participation in that category also. So again, we're just trying to maximize the participation and make sure that our, eff our effort is consistent with providing that maximum participation in each of the three categories for small businesses, women businesses, and, and minority businesses. With that increased um, um, analysis of good faith effort and requirement that there's a documentation provided at the time of bidding, that we want effort for each of the three categories, we know that there's gonna be opportunities or increase, potentially increased instances, instances where the good faith effort that a business that's been participating for years 
did not notice the change or the increase in focus in a certain area. So we want the, to make sure we have an appeal process and for that appeal process to not necessarily um, to minimize the impact it will have on the overall procurement time cycle. So we're looking at an administrative reconsideration panel. Now, for a lot of DBE programs, they have an administration reconsideration officer. We're recommending a panel, panel just because a, if, one, if a person goes out sick or, an, or vacation, we want to keep the process moving. Secondly, we want to look at if the panel with three to five people, then there's a potential that we can retain uh, learn, knowledge and a learning curve. So if a person takes another position, uh, there's still, there's, um, it reduces the hurdle of having and the uh, knowledge gap and expertise gap. Um, the likelihood that all three <laughs> will be out is, or three to five, is that we want to provide opportunity for continuity and again, and minimize the impact on the procurement process if someone's out or unexpectedly ill or takes another position. So that was the goal over a, a officer over a panel. The other part of the reconsideration process is that it's only for the apparent successful vendor. So this is in those instances, this is for the vendor that, but for the diversity goal compliance, they would be recommended for the award. So again, we're still trying to limit the process. Anyone else that's on the tab sheet, we're always available to at a, at a time that's, you know, to meet with them and provide any additional understanding on why their good faith effort was judged by DEI to be in this case and also to get feedback from them. That's not an um, uh, uh, opportunity that's not going to occur. This is just more to have a process for if the apparent successful vendor is compliant and accept in that area, this is their appeal process. And that's why we wanted the process to be um, informal and, and as, um, has as minimum of an impact on the procurement cycle as process to keep the process moving. So that, the, go ahead, I'm sorry. So the administrative um, panel will be even before the SB grievance um, board. Um, because the SB Grievance Board, as you know, is a public body, so it has to have an agenda posted, it has to have a, a meeting with the public meeting, uh, it has to meet all the public meeting requirements. The reconsider uh, administrative reconsideration panel would be more informal than that, and it was more of a quicker panel to, um, a quicker e review, even then the apparent successful vendor can determine if they just want to have what we're calling a no meeting where they send in their documentation, that group would meet and evaluate the additional documentation or the, the vendor can choose if they wanna have a meeting where they present and a meeting can either be virtually or in person, again, at the vendor's um, request and for that process. So again, it's a the process is provide flexibility, but also make sure that we are having a minimal impact on the timeline of the procurement process. The next change that I want to discuss is related to RFPs and RFQs. Basically with bids, with a formal bid, when the bid comes in, there, the information is there for us to evaluate the bid and that's the information that's going to be evaluated to determine their compliance with the diversity goals and or their good faith effort. With RFPs and RFQs, there's especially, first of all, with RFQs, you're making a selection on qualifications and the vendors are proposing based on their view of what the scope is going to be. However, there hasn't been a price negotiated or provided, and they are also, um, so we can't necessarily at that point that we evaluate the bid tab, we have a finite answer as to whether or not the final participation percentage will meet, uh, will be uh, attained based on the goal for that contract because the scope has not been finalized. And for a similar reason with RFPs, is um, there may be a price, but again, the pro um, proposal and final scope of work has not been determined. This is what the vendor is proposing, and this is how they're proposing based on their understanding of the contract to meet the diversity goals. DEI, we make our evaluation based on that intent, and we 
best try to make a our best guess of way based on where their proposal and the goals and what they their slate of MBEs, WBEs, and SBEs they propose, whether or not it looks like they're likely to meet the goal and that they provided what we feel is good faith effort to meet the goal. So what we're asking here is that once that contract is finalized, that there's just a quick review by DEI to make sure that, okay, now that we have the final scope of work and a price, that the percentages for the SBE, MBE, and WBEs are still in alignment with the overall goal before contract award. The next um, proposal is the change in our data collection. One of the major um, recommendations from the disparity study, because the count was about data collection. The county, as you know, has made a commitment to do this disparity study every five years. And they look at our contracting and purchasing habits for the past five years um, as part of each of those disparity study contracts. The easier and the more comprehensive our data is when we turn that information over to the consultant, the, the better pricing and the uh, better pricing we can achieve and also it increases the reliability or just the analysis of our data because they have the information that is not like they have to go back and recreate the history. So one of the things that we're looking to improve is our collection on the final contract amount. Currently, the Department of Equity and Inclusion, prior procurement and diversity, which was much smaller, now we are at the current capacity. There, we only were able to provide uh, monitoring intensely for contracts that had a diversity goal. But one of the components of the disparity study is to determine, but for a goal, how are your contracting? What are your contracting practices? So the, the county's diversity program is based on subcontracting. However, so because we have set a goal, part of that process triggers that we get to provide, get information from the vendors, the prime vendor, and the subcontractors that are um, slated to meet the diversity goals to collect that information. However, other contracts that do not have a diversity goal, there is no subcontracting um, information collected on those contracts. And there can be possibly, and, and also the county only has a contract with the prime. So we may not know, how, uh, have a, we do not have an accurate details on how much is subcontracted in general on county contracts and what are the demographics of the of those contracts. Again, we still don't, so we, it's a big jump <laughs> to get that information. So one of the things when we work with Griffin and Strong's, we said, well, if we get this information at the end of a contract, not, we don't wanna increase the burden that every month when the county department is paying, they get this information. We're just asking as part of that last payment, the vendor provides a list summarizing well, who were all the subcontractors on this contract? What was the scope of work sub to them? And what was the dollar value? And are, you, are they certified? Now, again, th that's their self-affidavit where they cert the, the subs can document it. And that's not necessarily that they have to be certified with the county. There could be vendors for whatever reasons that have chosen that are a minority-owned business that would meet our qualifications to be certified but haven't chose to, haven't chose to do so, but they still may be participating in our contracts and as far as overall participation, that's still valuable to determine how we're contracting. So that's the one requirement that we want to make sure as part of that last payment, every contractor provides a summary of all the subcontractors used on our contracts. The next area is the grievance hearing board. The change that we're proposing here is that it's not tied to a certain job title or organizational position in the county. We're looking at it being similar to um, three, just be three, appoints, uh, three appointments from county staff to the board um, instead of being tied to pre previous job descriptions. A couple of reasons, certain job titles change, uh, but the ordinance has specific titles, deputy chief of staff development, which that may not be the current title based on if it's their new county engineer, I mean, new county executive. The other is that we want to retain expertise. 
Um, for example, if someone's been on the board for a couple of years in one role, but then they take another position in the county, so they're no longer by code because of that title on the board, but their expertise is valuable, they have an understanding of the process, we want to be able to, the county executive to be able to retain that expertise on this board and not lose it just because there's a change in that person's title. So on that point, through the chair, would that have to come through county council for some legislative change for the, for the code or anything? So the, the actual board was part of the SBE policy. So by bringing it, um, the SBE policy to updates, that's the change. So that would, that's one of the items that's being considered. The grievance board wasn't a separate body. I mean, it wasn't a separate appointed body that was designated in the code. So similarly now, for instance, when um, in January, the chief of staff or county council sends us a list of who's been assigned to the SBE grievance hearing board, it would be similar that the county executive would make his similar appointment to the board, to the grievance hearing board. Okay, so legislatively, we don't have to change the, the title, taking the titles out. Well, as part of the titles for the grievance hearings were part of the SB policy. So the policy this that's before policy. you has it in there. So yes, I guess the answer is yes, there is a legislation, but not separate as part of this policy. Gotcha. Sorry Thank about you. that. So there, there seems to be a, a proliferation of various boards as part of this process. And, and I'm wondering why we need both a grievance board and an administrative review board. Why can't uh, one board handle both of these responsibilities? So my understanding was that the Grievance Hearing Board is a public body, so it has to have a public be meeting and a public genius. I I'm not sure legally can they have a subcomponent that's not public. We're fine if there's a subcommittee um, or if there's certain items on the agenda that do not have to be public. I'm not sure uh, legally how that works with the board or body. Um, I believe that um, based on the composition of the grievance uh, hearing board, that it's a public body with um, public meeting requirements, whereas the um, other board is not. Thank you. And, and, and Councilman, that's why also I remember at the last meeting you mentioned the Board of Control, but again, the Board of Control is a public body. It has the posting requirements and agenda requirements. And so that was the only reason for adding a separate panel as part of the, imp make sure the impact to the procurement process um, was more informal and minimized. Okay, and as far as that <clears throat> informal panel, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, who, how many people serve on it? We're recommending three to five. Three to five. And, and who, would they, who would they be? At this point, we're, I would work with regional collaboration. We're looking to, our goal is to have the panel members be um, obviously county employees. They will be appointed by the county executive. And our goal is that they're not heavily involved in procurement, but have a knowledge of procurement. Again, we don't want, for instance, um, nothing against different departments that have a heavy procurement, but then there's, there, it's already a, a dual interest. Okay. For the goal is to have some entities that may deal with procurement, have an understanding of procurement, but they're not directly involved yeah, or consistently have contracts the majority <clears throat> of time that would be on this um, reconsideration or have vendors that provide services to their agencies. So then if if a contractor had an issue and didn't like the result of the, the informal panel, then then they would go to the public hearing. Is that how it would be? Public yes, body? the next is the SB like Supreme and Court. And I believe I'm... I, the, it would be after the SB agreements here. So if you go to the uh, panel, then you wouldn't go to the grievance hearing board. But oh, then you, that oh, doesn't give you reduce any appeals. That's my panel, understanding. The panel doesn't go first. The, law department. The, the panel doesn't go first. I'm confused. I thought the, the panel, panel goes first. Let me. I wanted to make sure there was something about when they go to. 
I believe they can go after if they don't like the grievance hearing, but it's not to be concurrent. So they can go to the, the public body after the informal process. Right. Correct. Right. Everybody, on this, everybody understand that? Get that? Okay. Miss Baker, you have something? I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, I had said that um, it's my understanding that the contractor can go to the informal panel first and then go to the public grievance board after if, if it doesn't work out. So you would have the public hearing last. I need to clarify that with Director Hoos. I think, I, it makes, well, um, I think it makes more sense that way if it's not that way. Okay, we're, we're fine. Meanwhile, while that company is protesting the result, what happens with the company that was chosen? Is everything just waiting to hear whether or not they're going to be told, no, I'm sorry, the grievance board did find us at fault, now you're the contractor. How does yeah, that work? That's a good question. So what is the, t what is the time element that, in, in all of this? Because we want to keep projects moving and processes moving. And yet we want an element of fairness if there's an, an issue. So um, how would that work, Ms. Ms. Baker's question, as far as Want me the... to repeat that? Yes, I'm sorry. That's I okay. Being... I know you were. Um, if a company was told, I'm sorry, you don't meet the standards and you can appeal, and they go through the first appeal with the um, grievance hearing board, I think that's the non-public, right? Administrative reconsideration panel. Right, and then uh, maybe they take it to the next step if they don't like what they say. What happens to the original contractor that you did approve? Are they waiting for this to come to an end before they can start knowing that they, in fact, do have the job? So the... Time is, is lost waiting for this to be resolved. It could be... Okay, so the... When the evaluation process, when we do the tab sheet, once the technical review, which is done by the department, they'll know at that time the administrative um, apparent successful vendor, but it's not compliant. They will notify them. They can notify, and they have three days to, I believe it's three days to respond to notify us if they will, um, five days to get, um, yeah, three days to get back to us to get it going. We're hoping that the administrative panel is meeting at least twice a month, but they can, because they can always cancel if there's no item before them. And that in all processes, if the count of the department has decided for whatever reason that they need to proceed and not wait, or they, um, sometimes the department might decide to proceed with the apparent bidder that's not um, compliant. So for instance, the, I, I hate to say this, but we do have a complicated process. So we do have a price preference. And so the price preference says that if a bidder is the low bidder and we don't, and we can go within this percentage to find someone that is compliant. So the department might have, if on a, on a bid, the department might have chosen to do that. Or they might have chosen to, if there was no one, we have bids where the low bidder is not compliant and no one else is compliant within that price preference. So the department, again, may choose for whatever reason that they need to proceed because of closing construction season, losing federal, um, losing grant funds or funds to proceed. Um, so, so do they supersede then the decision that you're making? As a, I can recommend, and as I said during the confirmation, I try to work with departments and we try to come with a common goal, and then that's when it can escalate up, depending upon what the, there's always competing factors with a lot of uh, items. Um, there's always the opportunity to rebid. That, that's also the opportunity that the department might choose, or the depart, or the, the part, DEI and the department say, hey, let's just rebid. <laughs> so there's a lot of factors that could happen. Um, again, as you also with even if there's not a issue on diversity compliant RFPs and RFQs, you have people that protest because of scoring. So there's always the potential for a vendor to not be happy with the success, the selection, and so they can even come to the the contracting authority 
We've had incidents, instances, instances where you've been involved with the Board of Control, mm -hmm. where we've made a recommendation to the department and the, the vendor that didn't win the contract still has that opportunity at that point. So there's our process, while it's complicated, there's still always opportunities at any point for them to continue protesting. I, I guess. Uh, so the time wise, there yeah. could be a delay, but th depending upon our goal is obviously we want to have um, a transparent process. We want people to have an understanding of how our selections were made, but we also understand at some point there may not be a uh, a consensus on that selection. Right. So there's always, we're not going to squash anyone's opportunity to voice their displeasure. So if there was a, if I may, mm -hmm. so if there was a dispute between um, the selection made by would that be by by Director Dever, if he made that, if they, if his department made that selection, and then you're reviewing and say, well, wait a minute, you made a selection that uh, does not meet the new criteria. We would prefer that you choose another company. I don't know. Am, am I in the? Uh, well, we would. Yeah. So. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You well, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's how, how it happens. Is it? I mean, is that he looks at the bids? He decides. Yes, this one is who we need. He has all the, you know. But then it goes. I would imagine it then goes to you, for for your observation, and you kick it back to him and say, no, this is not your first choice. Has some issues, and I would prefer that you take maybe the second person in line. Is that how that works or? So, yeah, similar in general. So the first bid is by the purchasing department buyers. They do the technical buyer, it's a tab sheet. Got it. Then it goes to, if there's diversity goals, it goes to DEI. We evaluate based on the information we have in the status, whether or not we think they're, they've met the goal. Okay. And then it goes to the department. In this case, if you, the situation we're talking about would be public works, mm -hmm. they would do a technical review. If there was an issue, they might, so they are, when the department get the tab sheet, they've seen the other entities review. Right. And um, there can be a discussion, or if I see the tab sheet, I might send an email <coughs> to, let's say if I knew it was construction, I might send the email to the um, construction administrator and say, hey, you only have blank vendors and no one met the goal, it's close to the season, we've had a history, blah, blah, blah. Are you, can you rebid? Do you have enough time to just rebid? Blah, blah, blah. I would, usually we're not gonna discuss who should get it. They're making a technical review. They're the ones that have to, they're the experts at knowing the scope of work and the goods and services. Um, the issue might be, well, why didn't Lenora, why weren't they judge this uh, why, why did you judge this or why it looks like they have similar to someone else? What was the right. understanding? And we discuss it and try to come up, is, or is this something we want to rebid? Is it something that based on your understanding of the strategy for your, your department and the other constraints that you need to proceed in this case? And then we come up with a plan for the next time. A lot of the things that we buy, we buy over again. We say, okay, well, next time we're going to have to do this or next time we need it. So we try to work things out to get the balance of all the competing interests. Right. Well, you know, I, I guess my only concern with, with all of it, and I know that you there's a lot of time and effort in this and there's a lot of good work in this. I'm just a little concerned about the um, the, the contracts or the, the actual jobs and the implementation of getting it done. And I think I expressed that last time. I, I haven't heard from um, Director um, Dever so I would, I guess I can assume that he is 100% on board and is not concerned about the delays and um, that uh, he is good to go. Am I, am I okay with I've that? I've distributed the policy similarly in August to all the directors. There's going to be an adjustment for all. Now, in this case, we're adding an additional opportunity for the vendor for reconsideration, all the items and discussions that I discussed, that I mentioned, are discussions that are, are occurring now without this policy. Yeah. But it's they're, not, they're, isn't, these are things that are occurring now. This just provides a, a actual opportunity for the apparent low vendor to say here. And, and, and I also have those discussions now, like on 
one of the situations um, that was earlier this summer, the vendor called and said, hey, Lenora, um, I'm, I was told we're going to rebid. I thought I submitted good faith effort, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, this is blah, blah, blah. Why? What was the issue here? Oh, okay. And where does it say that in the policy? I pointed them to the page and said, okay, I have an understanding now. Yeah. It's not really, and we're looking at it to be parallel. Again, as I stated, there's always the opportunity for a vendor to protest at any point in the process. That So we're um, that's an item that it could occur at any point. We try to make sure our process is clear. We understand the, the um, when there's change, there's always that learning curve. And our hope is that this is just an opportunity to say, hey, we want everyone to learn from the good faith effort, the opportunity. Um, again, it, this is only for the apparent low. And usually with, for instance, in construction, it's a bid. So they already have the price preference option. Right. So there may not even be, uh, it may be one, uh, one occurrence a year maybe for this. You think only one occurrence a year? You, so with, you the, think with bids or construction? Because with, with, first of all, with construction, if they're federally funded, then it's going to be the uh, ODOT's DBE program. So that's not going to be my department. Then the ones that are, are construction that we're locally funding, then they have the price preference, which basically states that if the low bidder is non-compliant, which is the same thing, this is right. the apparent successful vendor, they're not compliant. Unless there's a vendor that is within this price preference that is compliant, they're still going to get the bid. It's only that unique instance where the low bidder is not compliant based on my assessment, right. and there's someone within that 5 or 8 or 10 percent that is compliant that they may not get the bid. So those uh, 85 that you talked about of the larger contractors, um, those are the ones you might think maybe one a year you may have an issue. Right. But the 500 that we typically see in Board of Control, those are the ones perhaps that would be using this, uh, you would see more of. Well, they will, I'm not going to set a goal for the ones under 50,000. So this doesn't even occur for them. Under the 50,000, all we're asking is for a notification to small businesses and MBEs and WBEs. I don't set a goal, and so there's nothing to say whether they met good faith effort or not. Oh, I don't think I understood that. All right, so if I understand you right, the 85 that you think are coming through in the large contracts, it would be a rare occurrence yeah. that you would uh, contest it and it would have to go through a grievance hearing, you would yes. not see that grievance hearing meeting every week or every month or, no, no that is okay. So In all the years with the, before the administrative reconsideration panel, the SBE grievance hearing board would see these and they've, we've never had one go to that point. Right, but, but we're, we're tightening it. Right. So that's where I think maybe right. we could be seeing more of it, don't you think? Yes. Yes, that's one of the reasons, because we are becoming more stringent. We're having a more stringent program, so, if we are so there's becoming, a learning curve. We're becoming more stringent, and we're really, you know, making the details, making it accountable for them. How often do you think you would be challenging in your experience of looking at companies and, and what they do? How often do you think they may contest it? So, again, it's the 85 that... Formal bids, RFPs, and RFQs on average per year. Okay. A lot of those we can't set a goal. I think. Let me look at. So of those eighty-five, how many of those would not would be in the? So if you look at, for instance, last in twenty twenty, I was only able to set a goal on twenty-five items. That was in 2020. 2021, so far this year, I've been able to set a goal on 33. Of the 85? Yes, on, yes. Okay, so in 2022, if it grows like that, you might, it may be half. No, I don't see that. You don't see it grow? No, the, so 25, I set a goal. Yeah. Then you look at most people compliance and good faith efforts. So the if you look at, let me see, statistically, because um, I try to look at the ones that were a price preference or we're, we're trying to collect data on 
price preference. So I would say on average, out of the 25, there might be, I don't know, five or six. Okay. So maybe 20% of those would contest it. And now no, the no, more... five or six that were not compliant. Okay. So, uh, okay. so about 20% aren't compliant. When I say when I say non when I mean we say they're completely non compliant, I would say that are the awarded vendor. Okay. Maybe it's lower than that. Maybe I would say it probably was, I don't know we three won't to know four until we're really in it. Right. Yeah. yeah. But it's right now. It's not. There aren't very many situations where the rec apparent low bidder is the is non compliant, and there is no other. There's a. They're, we're not going to do an award, award or something. If I just may wrap up. So in your experience, because you've been doing this for a while, um, do you anticipate that any of the directors that are involved in this process from the beginning of the bid to the award and the contractors working and then they oversee that work, do you see any of them push back at all? Have they all been, yes, I don't see anything here that I would change or I have concerns about? Or, Well, I think when the county in general, the concern is always over the time of the procurement process. It takes three to four months. Mm -hmm. So there's always a concern about uh, another requirement. Yeah. And this is an opportunity for someone to appeal. It's not a it's, it may not impact any of the processes. Um, I think it's cost benefit analysis. If we do what we've always done, we're going to get what we've always done. Yeah. I guess so. I'm just asking, are you going to be, are you, do you have a very receptive environment that you're working in with your other directors or are you going to be, you know, constantly clashing of, I got to get this done and you're slowing me down kind of mentality. Where, where do you see yourself moving forward in bringing these, re, these requirements I, I think my responsibility is to set us up for success. So it's to make sure we do training to look at the analysis and try to head off issues early on and to have an understanding of, okay, um, we have discussions and there is a learning curve. That's why one of the things we definitely want to do is train and say, uh, do um, be a resource here. This is what you could do at this time. This is what, what service we can offer. But there's, I, I don't see it being, um, I guess it's difficult for me to answer that and that the point is not like I expect um, easy, smooth path. Yeah. It's a change, it's learning. I think there is some type of, there's a change fatigue because this same population has gone through a phase one of the ERP, phase two of the ERP. Uh, now we're doing a, a change that impacts diversity. So there's gonna be that fatigue, we're still in the midst of a pandemic. So this is it's not like this is the first change in five years. The, it's the same procurement staff, field buyers, OPD, I mean, the Department of Purchasing buyer, there's still that fatigue. So there's still some working remote, some working in turn. So it's still, I'm anticipating the need for a lot of communication. I'm anticipating a lot of understanding my side hey, um, like, for instance, now I'm working with HR because to have a better understanding of their scope of work, well, how they see the contract functioning right. so that I could be better about how I set goals and how I evaluate the good faith effort. Right. So there's a mutual growing. It's not about here's a hard number. It has to be growth on both sides. And I sometimes think, it takes honest discussion. I, I think a good word might be a facilitator. Yes. Someone who yeah. can move and the process fair, along. And I mean, you have been very... Um, forthright in giving specific documents on how it is you'd like to see your department and what the rules are based on the equity study. So it's not like this is a secret. So if any director that is trying to keep things moving has any issue, there certainly is opportunity for them to step up and say something. And I haven't heard any no, pushback. No, I, I haven't heard anything. And it's my understanding, too, that uh, Mr. Dever is on board with this um, legislation and, and uh, has an excellent working relationship with, with Lenora. So I, I um, don't see that being an issue. I think it's, 
I think all the directors are going to have to work together. Right. Um, that's that's kind of what this is all about. And it's new, and there's change, and there'll be some resistance, and there'll be some bumps along the way. That's that's how we progress. Um, but I, but I think overall, I know Lenora has worked a great deal with the law department on this as well. So I know they've been looking at those elements, legal elements, to make sure things are done in a fair manner for everybody. Um, so I think that that's important that we we know that as well. So, um, Mr. Mr. Miller. You mentioned that you really didn't have goal setting on contracts other under 50,000 that aren't formally bid. Can you give me some ballpark estimate on a dollar amount basis of what percentage of, of the county's contracting is in those over $50,000 formal bids and what percentage is in the under $50,000? Uh, I would say, um, let me see if I brought our latest disparity study. Uh, we're doing our reports. Um, let me look one second. I would say for this year, we've awarded approximately, I believe, 118 million. Second, sorry. I wish I had it all a quick recall. I have to go to my trusty binder. <laughs> um, on average, it's at least about 100 million. Yeah, so wait a minute, one second. And for under 50, I would say we do, if you do the high number, I would say there's about 10 to 15 a week. There's at least 50 board of control meetings. So that's why I say it's about at least 500. So 500 at the most 50,000. So that might be about five million at least, five million under fifty. And it may again, it could be more because under a thousand, I don't necessarily see it goes through the PO. I would have to run a PO report. Uh, but the fifty five hundred at the fifty thousand using the fifty thousand threshold, that's that's about at least. Uh, 25, I'm sorry, about 25 million, 25 to 50 million. So there's a, a larger impact on the over 50, 000, I mean, the over 50,000, but it's only 85 opportunities to make those awards. Now, a lot of those have multiple awards within them. And the under 50,000, it could be more than 500, but usually the threshold is 50,000, 49,999. Okay, well, it's pretty clear that a heavy preponderance of, of our contracting dollar amount is in those larger contracts. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, some attention to uh, how we can be more effective on DEI and the under 50,000 might be a good thing to think about. Right. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Do you want to proceed? So the um, after the data collection, the next changes are the changes related to the outreach. Is the first relates to the 30-day posting. Um, again, that just provides the opportunity for businesses that are not used to dealing with the county and our procurement process, that longer window of the RFP, RFB, RFQ being on the streets and available provides them a longer opportunity to develop a response that meets the requirements. And also as SBEs, MBEs, and WBEs, if there's a goal set, if those one of the, the uh, few to have the goal set on them, they have the opportunity to try to pursue being a sub, hopefully if they haven't been, if they aren't currently certified, but they could still make an uh, offer to prime bidders. We always recommend to MBEs, WBEs that you 
get a hold of the plan holders list so you know who might be interested in bidding on an opportunity and provide outreach to them on the services that your company offers. So that 30 days provides um, an opportunity, a longer window. The current window um, is two weeks in a day for bids. So that's 15 going to 30 days. And RFPs are usually three weeks in a day, so 22 days to eight, um, additional eight days to the 30 days there. Again, this for reasonable, make reasonable efforts. We understand it if, again, if there's a pressing timeline, or some other factor of um, grant timelines, things of that sort, that they need to do the standard window, then um, we understand that those type of occurrences occur. So it's, the goal is for departments to make sure there's a reasonable effort to do 30 days advertising. In addition to the actual time that is advertised, we're, um, as part of the executive order, part of our outreach is to make sure we're doing a 24-month forecast of what we plan to um, purchase in a 24-month window. That provides, again, opportunities for entities that are not used to county business or don't know what exactly the county buy or the full um, diversity, the, the, the broad reach of all the different goods and services that the county buys, they can have that look at that forecast. They can see when we anticipate buying it, what the anticipated dollar amount is for that purchase. Also, they can see what is the um, anticipated procurement method, and they can start doing homework again early on. They can maybe make public records requests on um, what was the last time you bought this con this these goods or services? What were the requirements? They may change, but still it gives businesses that are not used to dealing with the county uh, opportunity to learn about goods and services that we're buying and match their goods and services and that they can start uh, preparing for when that opportunity presents itself. And that's supposed to be updated semi-annually. The first one was um, advertised July 1st. The next one is going to be advertised or posted January 1st. We're in the process now of updating the, um, the forecast. Mr. And Chairman. Go ahead. Mr. Miller. I certainly endorse the forecast. I get a, a lot of inquiries about when are you going to bid this or that. Uh, my question is whether the forecast is going to cover only those uh, contracts in the formal bidding over $50,000 range, or is it going to be broader than that and also include uh, some or all of the smaller contracts? That's, it's supposed to include the in, informal purchases also. Okay, great. Thank you. And, and, and as you stated, that's very important since those have a shorter window, eight hours, one to five days. So the, the, the completeness of that forecast helps provide that information. Okay, great. Thank you. And also as part of preparing that forecast, we're looking at it as an opportunity. So we, once the department tell us what they're planning to purchase over the next 24 month period, we can also look at those purchases to see which ones are good candidates for the small business set aside program. So again, we can um, find out what the departments are planning to purchase, analyze based on the criteria that was, and the criteria that's presented in the manual is the criteria that was submitted back in 2016 when as part of the county code requirement to say what is the criteria for selecting um, small business set asides. Um, the first criteria is we want to make sure that there are no funding um, issues um, or requirements that preclude us from doing a small business set aside. Again, that's when small businesses compete against each other. So there may be, if we're doing, if that's funded with grant funds or some other funding, they may not want you reducing the pool of vendors that can compete. The other requirements to make sure that it's a, a, the scope of work is typical for that industry. Again, we're asking small businesses to compete against each other. We want to make sure that that's a, 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 a typical project for that industry. We don't want small businesses competing against for a project that we know is already something that requires an extensive amount of experience and has a low margin of um, profit and or has a, a lot of intricate issues with the fulfillment of the requirements. We also want to make sure that for a small business set aside that, there ha that there's the usual or less performance bond and bonding requirements. Again, that's usually one of the hurdles of small businesses is getting the bonding requirements. So again, we're not going to pick a contractor 
purchase that has a high bonding requirement because of the risk that's assigned to the scope of work. So those are the criteria that we're using and we're, while the departments are gathering their list of what they're planning to purchase in the 24 month period, we're looking at it, that as an opportunity to see which as what contracts are, are good candidates so we can increase the utilization of the small business set aside program. The, the further slides are more just further details on the different um, changes that I just presented. So if there's a certain area that you'd like me to go into further detail, um, please let me know. Okay. Um, I, I've got just a question as far as outreach to some of these um, uh, MBE, WBE uh, contractors and such. How, how is that going to occur as far as reaching out, mm -hmm. you know, trying to find these contractors out there and, you know, letting them know, hey, this is what we're trying to do and making them more part of a part of the process. So currently we, um, and we plan to continue, we, we both will partner with other government entities on certification fairs, because obviously there's a lot of government entities that have similar programs. We also partner with um, other agencies such as GCP um, for their, in their program. They have a marketplace where they um, provide information on their opportunities from different government entities and private entities. Um, this morning, we were our, concurrently, we're doing an outreach with Black Pages, Matchmaker, so, and we did Matchmaker with Cozy, so in general, those. We've also taken the opportunity to um, maximize the Enforce system, is that we're using our certification information to provide them with um, each day a listing of bids and opportunities that are in the Enforce system. We also want to work with any of the um, business chambers. For instance, we've done outreach with different organizations about those opportunities so we can um, provide that information um, to them. So we're, we'll go where everyone thinks that there might be an opportunity. For instance, we partnered a, about a week or two ago with um, Fatherhood Initiative with HHS, and they had a combined workforce um, component and also the DEI component as far as getting the entrepreneurs' businesses certified. So we're looking at getting the information using all types of media. We work with the communications department for um, providing the um, information through our, the social media for the county. And in addition, we're looking at a program to maximize the county's YouTube so that we could put resources of, available on the, on the county YouTube about the programs and um, opportunities there that they can maximize. If the um, policies and programs, if, if and when they're approved, we are going to be doing training. Obviously, we have to partner with our per, um, counterparts in the city of Cleveland and, and regional sewer to pass the word to their vendors about the training that we're going to do on our current program proposed changes. Okay. Um, I just have a question as far as... Uh, the timing of this as far as moving forward, can this go the full three readings or is this something you want to start? Is there, will it prohibit you from starting any implementation of any of these processes if we, if we wait or what's your thoughts on that? So our goal is to get training going as soon as possible. Uh, we anticipated three readings. And um, so I was just speaking to um, Anka Davis because the legislation has to have an effective date. Mm -hmm. So we were looking at if it feels likely that it could be the three readings and council approval could be by the 9th and we can, we're okay with effective date of November 15th. Okay. That'll give us opportunity to start saving the date and then when there is official approval, we can proceed expeditiously with training. Right. Um, in, in, to the committee, in, in my eyes, I think, um, you know, Ms. Lockett's provided us with a sufficient enough reason to um, move this forward uh, for second reading. Um, if there are some tweaks that need to be made um, along the way, you know, obviously you let us know. And it's, you know, it's a process and it's new, like we said. And it seems to me like you've um, presented to the committee that you have enough flexibility and understanding of when to push, when to pull, and um, that it might require that along the way. But um, if there are any other questions, I'd, I'd move this on for, make a motion for second reading. I have a we have a question. Mr. Here. Chairman. Okay. We uh, have. 
Ms. Ms. Conwell has a question first. Uh, through the chair to um, Director Lockett, um, can the ERP upgrades allow our departments to automatically, or this department automatically notify vendors that are certified with the county that bids or projects are available? I know you talk about reaching out to people. Is there some kind of way that that can just automatically be done? Yes. Yeah, so we encourage even when, so as I say, we do a daily email with the opportunities and we encourage them to self register. Right. So a company can go into the inf register and supplier portal. They could pick the codes that match the goods and services that they provide. And whenever the county buys or has a bid opportunity for those goods that match those, they will get notification about those opportunities. Is that already happening or that will happen when we finish the ERP? So it's already available. It's available. Okay. Is it maximizing use? That's the part of the training on both sides. Gotcha. So it takes training on both sides because the okay. department themselves, when they do an informal bid, they put in the NIGP codes and it brings back all the companies. They have to choose to, um, as one of the things we'll be trained is that you select all the vendors that say they provide the goods so that they're notified about the opportunity. Then on the vendor side, they have to go in and actually complete the registration by saying, uh, indicating which goods and services they provide. I always encourage businesses to take your time and I say over select. You don't wanna pick one category and then have the department pick another category and because it didn't match, you get the notification. So I, I figure it's better. Again, I don't know, I know there is, Biz, I'm running a business is very busy, you know, it takes a lot of time, but I'd rather receive more emails about opportunities than not receive it. Okay, thank I agree. you. That helps. Uh, Mr. Miller? A question and a comment. First, the question is uh, regarding the 30 day opportunity for, for responding to bids under the new regime. Is this an a absolute requirement or is it a goal? It's a, they, so in general, they must, starting July 1st, it started July 1st, they must make a reasonable effort. So the default is that we, the Department of Purchasing, the county, when you submit an RFP, or RFQ, we expect 30 days, but if you have an a, a issue or reasoning why it can't be done, then there, there is a waiver process. Okay, well, that that makes sense, and it just uh, uh, expands the need for foresight to start bidding processes early enough so that uh, that you can allow this time and still get contract completed on, on schedule. Uh, my other more general comment is that, uh, that the changes here are are all incremental in nature, as opposed to being radical departures from prior policy. We just take what we did initially and take what we uh, uh, expanded somewhat with the first disparity study, and now we're, we're taking it and just ratcheting it up a few more notches, and, and, uh, and, and I think it, uh, it it's, it's not a, not anything that's going to be disruptive, and and I'm ready to uh, vote for a second reading. Okay. All right. With that, um, I will. I, I made a motion for second reading. On, Mr. Chair, oh, if I may. Uh, if okay, I may, okay, okay, yeah. uh, just a, a couple of clarifications. So, are we moving ahead with the November fifteenth effective date for the manuals? Um, I'd have to clarify with the staff. Is that on target for? that date i believe the next two, well so the next council meeting is uh november 9th i'm sorry october two, I'm sorry. i missed one yeah we're skipping a little bit i'm in november already so today's the 20th we have a meeting so Tuesday, the next council meeting is october 26th and the the council meeting after that is the 9th of november 9th yeah, it, should, it shouldn't be an issue to go three. It would be the ninth. I don't see any issues with that, and I have discussed it with, with we've had conversation with the law department. I, I don't see that as any issue. It 
Oh, I'm sorry, Jim Boyle, council staff. Thank you. So, so November 15 is all right. Uh, yeah, that should be fine. Yep. Um, the other clarification that um, I think we need to make is in section two of the ordinance. Um, section 50302 is not referenced. Section 50302 includes all the definitions for the um, minority business enterprise and female business enterprise, and these will not be changed. And I just want to make a, a clarification that Section 50302 will remain unchanged. So that Section 50302 will remain unchanged. Will correct. remain unchanged. And it is not mentioned here, and that's the intent. We just want to clarify it. Okay. Um, is there anything formal we have to do with that as far as the well, legislation itself? I think we itself? just need to vote for, to accept the revisions. Oh, okay. Oh, I could, we, we put it in the, I just want to make sure, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, go on. It's in the, are you talking about the definition? No, I'm talking about the ordinance. Okay. Um, so do we, uh, Anka, do we do that now or at the yes. council meet now? We can do that now? Okay. Um, so, so first I would make a motion uh, to accept uh, the amended, or, amended ordinance uh, 02021-0013 to include 50302 will remain, the words will remain unchanged as part of this legislation. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, I have a second to accept the amended legislation. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, opposed nay. The ayes have it. And then I will make a motion to uh, move uh, 02021 0013 as amended for second reading. Second. Do I have a motion? I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 And opposed? Nay. And ayes have it. And we'll move this forward on second reading then. Okay? Thank all right. You. Thank you, um, Ms. Lockett. We appreciate all your um, hard work on this and um, look forward to continue working with you to do good things in Cuyahoga County. Very much, you are. All right, thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, is there anything else, or co committee members, anything else, miscellaneous business before committee? And seeing none, uh, I'll make a motion to adjourn. I have a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. And Public Works will adjourn at 8, uh, 8 11.38 uh, a.m.